Rodney Fisher, our wonderful director. far, far away, where swallows fly in winter, there once lived a king. He had eleven sons and one daughter. You could tell at once that the eleven brothers were princes. They wore stars on their jackets and swords at their sides. At school, they wrote on golden slates with diamond pencils, and they were just as good at learning lessons off by heart as they were at reading them from a book. Their sister, Elise, had a little glass stool to sit on and a picture book filled with miracles and wonders.
twelve children were very happy, but happy they would not always be. Their mother, the queen, had died, you see, when they were very young. And one day the king, their father, decided to remarry. His new queen was a wicked woman, not at all nice to her stepchildren. They noticed this on the very first day at the huge party in the castle to celebrate the king's wedding. Instead of cakes and candied apples, the queen gave the children sand served in a teacup. Just pretend it's something else, she told them. The king was always busy with affairs of state and barely noticed when his little daughter, Elise, was bundled off to the country to be brought up by a farmer and his wife. The cruel queen told the king it would be good for his daughter's health. And it wasn't long before she had so filled the king's mind with horrible lies about the behavior of his 11 sons that he would have nothing more to do with them. It's time you took care of yourselves, she told the 11 dumbfounded boys. Away with you, out into the world. Fly away like clumsy, stupid birds without voices. But the wicked queen's witchcraft was not strong enough to harm the princes as much as she wished. Instead, they were turned into eleven magnificent swans. With a strange, haunting cry, just as the morning sun appeared, they flew out through the castle windows. The 
queen took three toads, kissed them, and instructed them one by one. Sit on Elise's head when she gets into the bath, she said to the first toad, so that she may become as lazy as you. To the second, she said, sit on her forehead so that she may become as ugly as you and her father won't know her. And you, she whispered to the third toad, place yourself upon her breast so that her heart may become corrupt and evil, <laughs> a torment to herself. <laughs> Queen placed the three toads in the clear water, which turned a murky shade of green. She called Elise, undressed her, and made her climb into the bath. The first toad sat in Elise's hair, the second on her forehead, the third upon her breast. But Elise seemed to be utterly unaware of them, and when she stood up, Three golden poppies were floating on the surface of the water. Elise was so innocent and good that the Queen's witchcraft had failed to have any power over her. When the Queen saw this, she began angrily rubbing walnut juice all over Elise's skin until it became quite swarthy, smearing her pretty face with a nasty smelling ointment and matting her long, thick hair with dirt and grease. When the king saw her, he was horrified. She can't possibly be a daughter of mine. No one in the castle would recognize poor Elise either. No one but the watchdog and the swallows. But they were small fry. Their opinions didn't count. Elise had found no sign of the eleven princes at the castle. How she longed to see them. I'll seek them out, she thought. I'll not rest until I find my brothers again. Silently, she crept out of the castle. She walked all day, uphill and down dale, until at last she reached the forest. When night came on, she lost her way amid the darkness. lay down on the soft moss. She said her evening prayer and rested her head on the trunk of a tree. Everything seemed so still in the forest, the air so mild, all around her in the grass and on the moss. There were glowworms, hundreds of them, shining like green fire. Ever so lightly, she brushed one of the branches hanging over her. The bright green insects floated down like falling stars. When Elise awoke, she could hear the distant sound of water. The sun was already high in the heavens, its beams glinting down through the tall trees that spread their leafy branches thickly overhead. Dense bushes grew all around, but Elise discovered a path that deer had trodden down to the water's edge. Clear water in which each leaf was reflected so sharply, you would have thought that they were painted on the surface of the pond. The moment 
Aunt Elise saw her own reflection in the water, she was shocked at how dark and greasy the face looked. But when she rubbed her eyes and forehead, her pale skin reappeared, and once she'd taken off her clothes and plunged into the pool of water, there was not a king's daughter in the whole wide world as lovely as she. After she dressed and plaited her hair, Elise wandered farther into the forest, and presently she found herself entering the darkest part of all. It was so still. She could hear her own footsteps. She could hear the crackle of every little withered leaf she trod upon. There was not a bird to be seen, not a sunbeam to penetrate the great thick branches of the trees. The tall trunks stood so close together that, looking straight ahead, it seemed as if one great wall of timber after another was shutting her in. Here was a loneliness she had never known before. The night grew very dark. Not a single little glowworm shone in the moss. Sadly, Elise lay down to sleep. And then it seemed that the branches above her head began to part, and God himself looked down upon her with gentle eyes. Angels peeped out around him, over his head and under his arms. When she woke in the morning, Elise couldn't be sure if it had been a dream or if it had really happened. She set off again. She'd only gone a short way before she met an old woman with berries in her basket. The old woman gave her some. Have you seen eleven princes riding through the forest? Elise asked. No, said the old woman. But yesterday I saw eleven swans swimming downstream. And straight away she led Elise to a steep bank at the bottom of which a stream was wending its way through a mass of trees whose leafy branches stretched out towards each other across the rapidly flowing water. Elise said goodbye to the old woman and followed the stream till she came to the place where it reached the open sea. The whole glorious ocean lay there before her, but not a ship not a boat of any kind was anywhere to be seen, nothing to carry her forward on her journey. <coughs> Elise gazed at the hundreds of round pebbles lying on the beach. Pieces of glass, iron and stone that had been shaped by the water. Water that was softer even than her own tender hands. Look, she cried. Look at the lesson the waves are teaching me. Oh, on they roll tirelessly until every sharp object becomes round and smooth. Oh, thank you, dear waves. I shall be just as tireless as you. And one day, I shall find my brothers. Then, on a mound of seaweed washed up by the tide, Elise saw eleven white feathers. She gathered them up. They had drops of water on them, but whether they were dew or tears, she couldn't tell. It was lonely on the shore, but Elise didn't mind, for the sea was continually changing. The sun was setting when eleven wild swans with gold crowns on their heads came flying towards the land. They glided one behind the other, 
looking like a long white ribbon in the sky. Elise clambered up the slope and hid behind a bush. The swans landed quite close by her, flapping their great white wings. <coughs> as soon as the sun had sunk below the horizon, the swans' feathers suddenly fell away from them, and there stood eleven handsome young men. Elise knew at once exactly who they were. They were her long-lost brothers, and she threw herself into their arms and called each one of them by name. And they, in turn, were overjoyed when they recognized their little sister, now so nearly grown up and very beautiful. They laughed and cried together. And soon, between them, they came to truly understand just how wicked their stepmother had been to them all. told of the danger that always faced them. We fly in the likeness of wild swans as long as the sun is in the sky. But when the sun sets, we become human again. And so at dusk, we must always be sure to be on safe on the ground. For if we were still to be in flight as human beings, down we'd come crashing to our death. To be safe from the wicked queen, the brothers lived in a country far, far away, across the ocean. But every year, we visit our homeland to see again the castle where our father lives and the grave where our dear mother lies buried. We have to fly across this great ocean and there is no island on our way where we may pass the night. Nothing but a lonely little rock sticking up in the middle of the swirling sea, just big enough for us to land and rest there. Now, else, Elise's brothers were very grateful for that little rock. We can't pass the night there in our human shape, or else we would never be able to visit our home again. It takes two of the longest days of the year to make such a thing. Just once a year, we have the chance to revisit the scenes of our childhood. And at last, we have found you, our dearest sister. We shall only be able to stay here for two more days, said the eldest. And then we must fly back across the ocean. How can we take you with us? We have neither ship nor boat. Elise longed to break the spell. If only I could set you free, she cried. And they talked and talked almost the whole night through, finally dozing off for a few hours. Next morning, it was the sound of wings whirring overhead that awakened Elise. The sun was up, and her brothers, now swans once more, were soaring in great swooping circles above her. When they finally flew away, they left their youngest brother behind. He, le he laid his head in Elise's lap. She stroked his wing, and they spent the whole day together. Towards, other, towards the evening, the others returned, and as soon as the sun dropped down below the horizon, they regained their human form. Tomorrow we must fly away, they told Elise. We dare not return for a year. Oh, how we dread the thought of leaving you behind. My arm is strong enough to carry you through the forest, said the eldest. So surely between us, our wings are strong enough to carry you over the sea. Have you the courage to come with us, Elise? Oh yes, yes, cried Elise, please. You must take me with you. The brothers spent the whole night weaving a mat of pliant willow bark and sinewy tough rushes. The mat they made was thick and strong, and Elise lay down upon it. Once the sun had risen and her brothers were wild swans once more, they seized the mat with their beaks 
and lifted their sleeping sister high up among the clouds. They were already far from land when Elise awoke. She thought she was dreaming. So strange did it seem to be carried through the air, so far above the sea. So high that a ship she saw below looked like a seagull floating on the water. All day long the wild swans flew on majestically, whizzing through the air like arrows. And yet, of course, their speed was not as fast as they were used to travelling. They had their sister to carry, and they knew they must reach the lonely rock in the middle of the ocean before nightfall. The storm was gathering as evening approached. Black clouds came up, violent squalls heralding a gale, and Elise was alarmed to see how rapidly the light was fading. There was still no sign of the solitary rock, and she could feel the wild swans struggling to quicken the beat of their wings. Oh dear, it was all her fault. She was the burden holding them back. The instant the sun had set, the swans would be turned into earthbound men again, and down they'd crash, helplessly drowning in the tumultuous sea. Black clouds were banked in a solid lead mass. Thunder and lightning formed, rumbling flash upon flash. The sun was on the very rim of the sea, and Elise's heart was beating violently. Suddenly the swans darted downwards so swiftly she thought she was falling, oh no! But next moment they were gliding smoothly again and suddenly Elise caught sight of the little rock that looked no bigger than a seal sticking its head above the water. Just as Elise's foot touched the solid ground, the sun sputtered into darkness like the last spark of a burning piece of paper. Her brothers clustered around her, and there was scarcely space enough for them to stand. Tightly they gripped each other's arms all night, while the storm-tossed sea dashed against the rock, drenching them in foam. <sighs> Daybreak. The air was pure and still, in spite of their ordeal, as soon as the sun was up, the wild swans seized the mat in their beaks again and eagerly lifted their precious cargo on high. A strong wind beneath their wings sped the swans on their journey. And long before the sun went down, Elise had her first glimpse of the country they were bound for. The loveliest blue mountains seemed to rise up in front of them, with forests of cedar, rosewood, and elm. A cave in the mountains was home to the wild swans. Dark green creepers intertwined so thickly around the mouth of the cave that they looked to Elise like a richly embroidered carpet. Half asleep, she lay down on the grass outside the cave. As soon as the light had faded in the west, her youngest brother appeared beside her. He led her to a little bedroom. Sweet dreams, he murmured. If only I could dream of a way to set you free, said Elise. Her mind could think of nothing else. She said a silent prayer. And even in her sleep, she went on praying. And all at once, she found herself floating in a palace of clouds that seemed to stretch for miles. A woman was coming towards her, so beautiful, so dazzling, so magnificently gowned, and yet so strangely like the old woman in the forest who had given her berries and told her about the swans with gold crowns on their heads. You can set your brother. 
mother's free, the woman told Elise. But I wonder if you have enough courage and endurance for the task. It's quite true that the sea is softer than your delicate hands, and yes, it can smooth the shape of rock, iron, and glass. But the sea does not feel the pain your fingers must endure. And it has no heart, so it need not undergo the fear and the agony you must suffer. Do you see this stinging nettle I'm holding in my hand? There are many such nettles growing outside this cave. Only those that grow there, or the ones that grow on graves in the churchyard, are of any use. Remember that. You must gather them, even though they blister your skin, and trample them under your bare feet, and make a yarn-like flax from them. With this green yarn, you must weave and hem eleven shirts. When you throw the shirts over the eleven wild swans, the spell of the wicked queen will be broken. The woman paused, then from her mouth came this terrible warning. From the moment you begin your task until the moment you complete it, even if it takes you several years, you must not utter a word. The fate of your brothers hangs upon your tongue. If so much as a single syllable escapes your lips, it will pierce your brothers' hearts like eleven lethal daggers. Whatever happens, you must always remember this. As she spoke, the woman brushed Elise's hand with the nettle. It caused a sharp, burning sensation, and the pain woke Elise up. Close by her bed lay a nettle just like the one in her dream. Elise got up and left the cave. She wanted to begin her task at once. With her bare hands, she grabbed hold of the stinging nettles. They seared the skin like fire. Great blisters appeared all over her hands and arms. Then she crushed the nettles with her bare feet and spun the green yarn. When her brothers returned that night, they were alarmed to find Elise so silent. They thought it must be some new spell that their wicked stepmother had put on her. But when they saw her hands, they realized what she was doing for their sake. The youngest brother wept, and when his tears fell upon her skin, Elise felt no more pain. Her blisters disappeared. All night she continued to work. She could not rest until her brothers were free. One ch shirt was completely finished. Now she was beginning on another. Suddenly, Elise was startled by a hunting horn ringing out among the hills. She heard hounds barking and the sounds of a hunt coming ever closer. Filled with fear, she quickly bundled up the yarn she had spun from the nettles and fled into the cave. A moment later, a huge dog sprang out from the bushes, immediately followed by another. Within a few minutes, a crowd of huntsmen were standing at the entrance of the cave. The most striking among them was the young king of this beautiful country. He smiled at Elise. How do you come to be here? he asked. Elise shook her head. She dared not speak. One word might cost her the life of her brothers. She hid her hands under her apron so that the king should not see how she suffered. Come with me, he said. This is no place for so sweet a child. If you are as good as you are beautiful, I shall dress you in silk and velvet, place a crown upon your head, and you will live in my palace. He lifted Elise onto his horse. She wept great tears and wrung her hands, but the king said, I want you to be happy, that 
that's all. One day you will thank me. Then away he rode through the mountains, holding her in front of him on his horse, while the rest of the hunt came galloping after. <clears throat> the king's jewel-encrusted capital, with its many churches and palaces, lay before them. And as the sun was setting, the king ushered Elise into his palace, where fountains played in marble halls and beautiful paintings decorated ceilings. But Elise had no eyes for any of this. Her eyes were filled with tears of sorrow. She resigned herself to letting attendants dress her in royal clothes, entwine her hair with rubies and pearls, and draw soft gloves over her blistered hands. And when she stood in her splendid costume, her beauty was so dazzling that the courtiers all bowed low before her. But when the king announced his intention to marry her, the Archbishop shook his head and whispered that this pretty creature from the woods was certainly a witch who had infatuated the King's heart. But the King wouldn't hear of it. He ordered music to be played, a sumptuous banquet to be prepared. The loveliest maidens danced around the bride and she was led through fragrant gardens into elaborately furnished halls. But still, no smile flew past over her lips, and no pleasure shone from her eyes. The king showed Elise the way to a little room that was close by her sleeping chamber. It was adorned with a splendid green tapestry that exactly resembled the cave in which the king had discovered her. The bundle of yarn she had spun from the nettles lay on the ground. And she saw the shirt she had already completed hanging by the wall. Here you can dream that you are back in your old home, said the king. Here is the work you were doing in the cave among all this splendor. It sometimes may amuse you to remember the past. Oh, when Elise saw these things, so dear to her heart, she smiled. The color returned to her cheeks at the thought of still being able to save her brothers. She kissed the king's hand. He pressed her to his heart and had the church bells rung to announce the wedding. The pretty, silent creature from the woods was to become queen of the land. words into the king's ear, but they made no impression upon him. The marriage was solemnized. The archbishop himself was obliged to put the crown on Elisa's head, and in his anger he pressed the narrow rim so firmly on her forehead that it hurt her. But a greater weight. Her sorrow for her brothers lay more heavily on her heart. A single word would have meant their death, so Elise was always silent. But in her eyes, you could see the deep affection she felt for the noble, handsome king. He did everything he could to make her happy, and every day her heart grew fonder. If only she dared confide in him, tell him of her terrible suffering. She knew she must remain silent until her work was done. And so Elise would slip away from the king every night. She would make her way to the little room that resembled the mountain cave. And there she would weave one shirt after another. But just as Elise was starting on the seventh shirt, she discovered she had run out of yarn. 
She knew that the nettles she needed grew on graves in the churchyard. Late one moonlit night, she crept out of the palace garden and into the empty streets until at last she came to the churchyard. Fearfully, she slipped through the gate. There, on a tombstone, sat a coven of witches. They took off their ragged clothes as if they were about to bathe and digging their long fingers into the fresh grass. They drew up dead bodies and devoured the rotting flesh. Trembling with fear, Elise was forced to walk past these filthy hags who fixed their wicked eyes upon her. Gathering the stinging nettles as quickly as she could, she hurried from the dreadful place. Only one person had witnessed Elise's midnight adventure. The Archbishop. He was now more convinced than ever that Elise was a witch. It is quite clear, he said, that through her enchantments, this creature has infatuated the king and all the people. The Archbishop told the king what he had seen and what he feared. As the king heard the Archbishop's slanderous words, two large tears ran down his cheeks. He was filled with doubt, and so, pretending to be asleep, he secretly watched as Elise rose every night from her bed and entered her little room. She had almost finished her great task. Only one shirt still had to be made, but alas, the yarn had run out, not a single nettle left. Even though she was terrified at the thought of visiting the churchyard again and seeing the hideous witches, Elise knew she had no choice. She set off for the churchyard, little knowing that the king and the archbishop were following her. They watched her disappear through the iron gates of the churchyard, and when they drew closer, they saw the ghastly witches sitting on the gravestones. The king quickly turned his face away. He imagined he'd seen Elise among those terrible hags. Elise, who had that very evening, had rested her head on his heart. Oh, it was too much for the king. Let the people judge her, he said. And the people condemned her to be burned at the stake. Elise was dragged from the king's luxurious apartment and imprisoned in a dank, dark cell where the wind whistled through the great windows. Instead of velvet and silk, they gave her the bundle of nettles she had gathered. Instead of a mattress, they gave her the shirts she had woven. Elise continued her work, and then towards evening, she heard the rustling of swan's wings at the grating. It was the youngest of her brothers who had found her at last. <coughs> Elise sobbed with joy, although she was sure this night would be her last. The archbishop had promised the king that he would sit with Elise during her final hours. But when he arrived, Elise shook her head and made signs for him to go. This night she must finish her task or all that she had suffered would be in vain. The Archbishop departed, muttering cruel words about her. In the early hours of the morning, well before dawn, the eleven brothers stood at the palace gates. They demanded an audience with the king. Quite impossible, they were told. The king is asleep and he must not be disturbed. The brothers pleaded, they begged, they threatened. The guard was called out. Eventually the king himself appeared. But by that time the sun was rising. All that the king saw were eleven white swans flying over the palace. And 
Now, the people came pouring out of the city gate. They were eager to see the young witch being burned at the stake. An old broken down horse pulled the cart in which she sat. She was dressed in a hessian sack. Her hair hung loose about her head. Her face was deathly pale and her lips moved soundlessly as her fingers continued weaving. Even while riding to death, Elise did not waver in her task. Ten shirts lay finished at her feet as she desperately attempted to complete the eleventh. Look at the witch, jeered the mob. See how she keeps mumbling to herself. What's she doing with her fingers? It's black magic, that's what it is. Take that green cloth from her, tear it in a thousand pieces. The mob crowded in, trying to tear up the shirts Elise had made. But eleven wild swans came flying down and perched around her on the cart, flapping their great white wings till the crowd gave way in panic. Just as the burly executioner was about to grab her by the arm, Elise threw the eleven shirts over the swans, whereupon eleven handsome princes stood in their place. Elise hadn't had time to finish her youngest brother's shirt. It was missing a sleeve, so instead of a left arm, the youngest prince had a wild swan's wing. At last, Elise was free to speak. I am innocent, she cried. And the people who saw what had happened bowed down before her. But Elise had fainted dead away. Grief, terror, and sudden joy had completely exhausted her. said Elise's eldest brother, and he reported everything that had happened. And while he spoke, the perfume of a thousand roses wafted through the air. Every stick of wood piled up around the stake had taken root. Great bushes had sprung up and merged into a magnificent hedge fragrant red roses. At the very top was a single flower of the purest white, shining like a star. The young king picked it and placed it on Elise's breast. Elise awoke with peace and happiness in her heart. Church bells rang out by themselves. Birds came warbling in great and there was a festive procession back to the palace, such as no king had ever seen before.